Welcome to another installment of our Pocus Power Hour. So I'm Peter Weimersheimer. I'm an emergency physician. I'm a VP of Education at Butterfly, and I'm here with my awesome colleague, Dr. Devinza Ransing, who's a cardiac anesthesiologist and VP of Research here at Butterfly. So we host these every month. Uh, the goal is really to cover different topics and how point-of-care ultrasound or Pocus can be harnessed to benefit patient care in clinical medicine and ideally in your clinical practice. We really want to support all of you in your journey to use POCUS. And today we have some fantastic guests, and we're going to really cover the value of POCUS in primary care and health screening. So you know, we have a Q&A uh, opportunity, so please submit some questions here. We'll try and get to them live. If not, we'll follow up with you to try and answer your questions. And now I'm going to hand the reins over to my colleague, Devinder to introduce some of our guests and to start some great discussions. So thank you for joining and please submit questions and Devinder, take it away. Thanks, Peter. Good to see you. Good to see our panelists. Happy midsummer for everyone. Can't believe it's already, you know, halfway through the summer. Um, really excited for our panel uh, and discussion today. Where we're really going to be looking into primary care and how the value of pony care ultrasound has really grown in both just the clinic-based environment, but also looking at the idea of health screening. Um, and with that, I have the honor of introducing first uh, Dr. Craig Bax. Maybe we'll start with you. If you could tell us a little bit about your background and then where your current uh, model is of how your care setting that you practice in. Okay, so I'm a 68-year-old uh, general internist, uh, board certified, uh, practiced for 40 years, primary care, internal medicine, some experience in administrative medicine as a chief medical officer. Um, but I... Uh, went back into primary care solo practice about uh, 12 years ago, um, was um, interested in obviously in diabetes and hypertension and cardiovascular care, but discovered um, an opportunity a program for reversal of arterial disease uh, called the Bale Dunin Method in 2013. And a big part of that process was uh, ultrasound to monitor arterial wall thickness cro called carotid intima media thickness ultrasound. And I'm trying not to get too bogged down in the details, but discovering that our arterial disease is actually, not only can you stop its progression, you can actually even cause regression. You need a way to monitor that. And that's part of a big part of that process. Uh, I know this might make the cardiac anesthesiologist a little bit nervous about his future business, but uh, there'll, there'll be plenty for, for a long time. Um, I think heart disease is not going away. Yeah, but, right. uh... but I'm, I'm doing my best. At any rate, uh, fast forward now for 10 years, I first I employed, a, I shouldn't say employed, I engaged with having a sonographer come to my office to do my CIMT monitoring. And I thought, what if I could do this myself? I bought a, a, a GE ultrasound probe at that time, $13,000. It's now somewhere in a recycling bin. I'm sure it's already been recycled. Uh, bought a Sonon, half the price because it had more features. And then somebody told me about Butterfly. And so uh, it, it really has all the, all the tools, including the imaging storage. So I use it to screen patients for the presence of atherosclerotic plaque, seeing is believing it's, so I call it motivating and then measuring, and then you mon you, uh, monitor their, uh, their results over time to maintain momentum. So over time, as, as things have evolved, I've, uh, managed to work with, uh, my CMT, reporter called, they're called Basal Labs. Uh, we now have a protocol, not only for screening to identify plaque, you know, do you have disease to how much disease do you have and what is your arterial age and disease burden? And we can do that in a quantitative way now using the butterfly ultrasound. And I'm just waiting for the vendor and Peter and everybody at Butterfly to figure out the AI to, uh, you know, tell us where the plaque is and uh, how to treat it. Well, you know, we, we look forward to talking about some R&D efforts here uh, towards the end of this uh, discussion. But let's, uh, I'll hand it over to Dr. Michael Drushel. I know you um, have been a longtime partner with Butterfly, and it's a really interesting model. I know I've learned a lot from you about how you've used point of care ultrasound in your clinic environment. You're in your clinic right now. Perhaps could you give us a little bit of your background? Yeah, sure. Thank you. Uh, so I'm a family physician. I work in a direct primary care in Northern Arizona. I have two partners here and I have been working with point of care ultrasound 
since medical school. I, I started mostly in the ER environment, then I added on obstetrics. I did deliveries for quite a while, actually, before starting my direct primary care. And so really practicing really full spectrum, broad scope, family medicine. Uh, before this current practice, I was in a critical access hospital, and I was also doing outpatient at the same time with deliveries. And so I got to see transitions from the card style ultrasound. Now I have my handheld butterfly that I use. And I'm also excited because now I get to uh, two, two to three times a year, I'll go and teach uh, point of care ultrasound uh, and sometimes work with residents and medical students to help them learn how they too can use it in their practice. And my colleagues know me as the guy who will use ultrasound on a quarter, sometimes even half my patients throughout the day. I do a lot of sports medicine as a result because uh, I can show people what's wrong with them. Uh, on the screen, I can do various procedures to help them using the ultrasound, but I also do the full scope of ultrasound. So you name a part of the body, I've probably scanned it. And <laughs> my patients know that I have an ultrasound. And so they're commonly asking me, oh, can you just show me what's wrong with me? And it's been very fulfilling. So I'm always happy to push the limits of what we can do with ultrasound. Awesome, looking forward to getting more of your insights. Peter, do you wanna introduce uh, Dr. Weissman? I'd love to. Uh, I, um, so yeah, I introduced Ashley Weissman, who was a colleague or is a colleague at UVM in Vermont, um, emergency physician who also uh, goes and works in rural Alaska. And all, and and uh, as you introduce yourself, you've been passionately talking about uh, this philosophy or the concept of how to start getting ultrasound in an outpatient setting where it really takes just the commitment to using it. So Ash, it's great to have you. Thank you. And so please introduce yourself and we'd love to hear a little bit about that passion you have for, for use. Sure. I'm Ash Wiseman. I'm an emergency physician in the University of Vermont Health Network, which includes work in four rural critical access hospitals with limited or no access to um, diagnostic ultrasound through any radiology service or ultrasound tech. And then I work in very remote Alaska in what I'll call full spectrum emergency medicine, which means I am on the June varsity team for helping with deliveries or helping with primary care and work in very remote clinics that are an airplane ride to an x-ray or a lab test. So in those contexts and in home visits, this is sort of really extended my practice into how can we use this in screening? How can we work in areas in an ER setting with no primary care where we are doing essentially all of this? And we are the primary teachers for our primary care colleagues who rotate through the ER. So I've taken a particular interest in bringing family medicine residents to our rural ERs for ultrasound focused specific ER shifts. And, um, and I found that handheld devices are really the way you get the probe into a physician's hand and then get that probe onto the patient. Um, so I have fun every day. Awesome. Well, why don't we jump into the topic of screening, Peter? Like, you know, I think that's a big topic for clinic-based care, right? Where um, providers are in charge with the idea of health screening for, you know, their patients. Now, how do you um, ask the panelists, maybe uh, Mike, if we could start with you on just understanding from the topic of health screening, how do you apply ultrasound for that topic? One of the easiest uses of ultrasound for health screening is for abdominal weight or aneurysm screening in my clinic. And so it's a really easy conversation to say, and I've got it right here and we can do it right now. And it only takes a few minutes. And, and that's really nice. The patients love that. Uh, and they love to have the answer right away. Uh, so for me to get my patients to do a abdominal or aortic aneurysm screening, it's a no brainer. It's really easy. And I also help out my colleagues when they feel a little less confident about it. Um, sometimes we'll, uh, add on some carotid artery flow waveforms. Um, and then, uh, obviously disease specific questions as well come up all the time, whether it's a DVT, lung issues, uh, abdominal issues, et cetera. Um, but uh, AAA is probably the most classic health screening that we do in family medicine. And has your screening show benefit? Have you had cases where you've detected things that uh, otherwise, you know, may have been missed? The, uh, I, the, the rate of uh, finding a AAA is fairly low. So I don't get a lot of cases in my 
immediate panel, um, but I have had cases where we get to follow it a lot closer. And so it's not uncommon that people have a AAA that you'll find them, they, they come and they sign up with me and, and I'm following along and, and they don't do their screenings as they should to follow up on that. So it's really easy then for me to, since I have the ultrasound here, that I'm keeping them more accountable for staying up to date with that. And we get good enough resolution that I feel confident that I can do it here in my own clinic and that's good because then it's more like that I'm going to pick it up when they do progress. And so I've had a number of patients that had a AAA and then they were progressing to the stage that they now need, uh, you know, talking about CT angiograms and talking to the vascular surgeon about next steps of management. But if it wasn't so easy to do, a lot of the average patient is not going to follow up as they should. And there's, all, you know, frankly, there's the, the cadence of screenings of normal, right? So how many patients have you screened or have we all screened for AAA who are in the demographic group that may have an angio or maybe even has a family history? And it's it's also a really nice patient uh, interaction to be able to look at them and say, you don't have one. And, you know, I'm not sure if that, if that be, belies that, that there's going to be now more debauchery afterwards, but but it's a, a really nice exchange to be able to do at the bedside and have that reassurance. Craig, you you have been pretty active screening. I, I don't know, Divinor, if you want to set up those the slides or sure. if you want to go yeah. through that. Sure, yeah, on the, all right. This pops up, Craig, you can go ahead and give a, an intro here as we kind of load these up. Well, your earlier comments about Triple A. I mean, I I'm starting to feel kind of bad about the fact I don't do abdominal scans. I'm more focused on that's late stage disease, you know, and that brings you know patient to the interventional stage of their uh, journey. I'm more focused on the much earlier, um, ideally preventive. But let's face it, when it comes to cardiovascular disease, most of us as adults are past the point of prevention, uh, and I, I, it's a much more, uh, much more target-rich environment, if, if I may use that uh, language. The point is that it's such arterial disease kills more individuals, men and women, than all cancers combined. It's the number one cause of death and disability through heart attack and stroke and and in vascular dementia, chronic kidney disease. Uh, so why are we not doing this more readily? Well, it's because we, you know, we screen for a lot of the, we traditionally screen for a lot of the contributing factors, hypertension, uh, elevated blood glucose, but unfortunately that's the latest stage of insulin resistance and diabetes. So why not screen earlier? Uh, it's, uh, so I, I learned that um, because I've learned that arterial disease is reversible, which is in itself a rather novel concept uh, in mainstream medicine. And, you know, we can have a whole well, it took me two days worth of preceptorship to learn that and then about five years to figure out how to do it reasonably well. But the first step is, you know, in order to, to get somebody to act to improve their health, you have to get their attention and, and a picture is worth a thousand words. And so it, you know, became uh, obvious to me that once I was able to show somebody their disease and uh, they were much more motivated to become engaged and act. So what the vendor is showing here is... Uh, on the very right side is a graphic uh, example of what we're really looking for. It's not for the uh, luminal obstruction that is uh, available and uh, that is revealed by velocities or waveforms or color flow Doppler, but by the disease that's actually in the wall of the artery. So the intima media thickness and the presence of plaque. So on the right hand, on the very right hand image uh, where you show that's, and that's very minimal plaque. I can, you know, if we had time, to show you much more obvious, you know, popcorn. And once you start, you know, scanning patients, you're just going to see so much disease. So what what the vendor is pointing to? Uh, let's go to the let's go to the left side image and does on my left hand just let that play yeah. through. You know, this is a cross sectional short axis view. You see the bulb then bifurcation then back together in the bulb in the common carotid artery, and that the, you see thickness in the wall of the artery. That is that's very minimal atherosclerotic plaque. And the whole concept is that our heart attacks and strokes happen when silent, stealthy, I call it stealthy, uh, threatening plaque ruptures suddenly and leads to a blood clot uh, for, uh, occlusion of, a, of either a coronary artery in situ or a branch vessel of the carotid artery and the, and the cerebral circulation causes a stroke. So by 
looking into the future, we can enable p patients to see, you know, what what their uh, what their threat is. I don't want to say risk; it's really it's a threat. They actually have the condition. What you're looking at, what Devendra was pointing at just there, was uh, the intima media wall that we that actually can be measured and reproducibly followed over time. Uh, compared to other individuals, uh, a population, age distribution. And what gives me the most fun is to say, you know, we can actually make your arteries younger and healthier and therefore make you safer from the threat of cardiovascular disease. Maybe go to the next slide. Uh, so this brings up the upper left-hand corner uh, is the uh, graphic of the progression of arterial disease. I use an analogy of it's like acne of the arterial wall. So the arterial wall is, is really the skin. Acne leads to formation of pimples. Atherosclerotic leads to formation of plaque. Plaque ruptures, like a pimple ruptures, and you get a blood clot, and that's the occlusive uh, event. But the middle um, panel on the left shows visualization of asymptomatic atherosclerotic disease, uh, a pragmatic open label study. This is pu published in Lancet in 2019. And you know, normally a blockbuster drug that has a 10% improvement in outcome, that would be considered a blockbuster drug. What would what if you could do something that led to a 50% improvement in cardiovascular risk in less than a year, simply by visualizing? Why? Because seeing is believing and people become motivated. Just like when that, you know, uh, soon to be young mother sees the you know, baby's movement in the heartbeat, it has a, you know, it has a, it makes a connection. And so, um, and then, but it would be cruel to, to bring this to the attention of patients if we didn't have some solutions. And that's, uh, but fortunately, um, there is a scalable solution. And that could be, again, I, as I said, a, a, you know, a, a, a very long discussion. So the, the link to the study, the Lancet study is, is there. Uh, so I was, I was using a, the, the ultrasound, the point of care ultrasound novel. Exclusively, I've done probably 2,500 uh, carotid scans uh, and initially just identifying plaque. But on the right-hand side, what you see is a report that I, I can send the images from a bilateral short axis view, bilateral long axis views, as you saw in the previous panel, and actually and send those images uh, via DICOM and create a report where the patient learns how they compare to other individuals their age. And although it's a little bit small, you can see that this individual on two successive occasions, about a year apart, uh, saw their vascular age drop from 70 to 65. Now that may not sound dramatic, but when the normal expectation is progression, you know, to disability or death um, from vascular disease, uh, that's a pretty good feeling. And and I'll just put in what I what's that's what it's done for patients in my practice. I haven't seen a stroke or a heart attack in the last 10 years, over a thousand patients who have been chosen for the presence of the disease. And that's not, that's not my, you know, I didn't innovate all that. I just learned how to do it, but it enables me to motivate patients to become engaged. But what it's also done, it's really transformed my professional experience from being one of reactive, you know, being available on call 20, for emergencies, rescue, uh, dealing with a lot of things to a much more proactive or, you know, a preemptive uh, effort uh, it's all scheduled. I can do so much of this by telemedicine once uh, we've had the ultrasound done. And then also now I'm in the last three to four years, I've developed a, a, a company program where I'm teaching the ultrasound, uh, the use of the Butterfly Ultrasound Pro to uh, other users you might not even think of like dental hygienists and optometrists and they're identifying disease and uh, sending patients. Why dental hygienists? About 30 to 30 to maybe 50% of all arterial disease uh, has an association or causative relationship with periodontal disease, endodontic disease. And so the patients are already there. They're properly positioned for a scan perfectly. And there's also a, you know, a revenue uh, model that uh, can be beneficial to all parties involved, but particularly the patient in, in a way that does it affordably. You wouldn't be able to do that with a $50,000 card based machine. So. Craig, just curious. I mean, that, again, really novel what you're doing here with, and I, and I think the theme of seeing is believing in how you you highlighted that by showing your patients, right, 
to something that's concrete that they can visualize and see and something that you said is modifiable, it changes practice, right? It changes behavior. Um, I think that's a very powerful tool. I wonder if the other panelists have other stories of how they've used the concept of now not having to just hide within the body and do your physical exam with your stethoscope and the patient just hearing your words, but now showing images and what that does for the ability of improving the quality of care you're able to provide. Um, Ash, any, any thoughts there? Yeah, you know, I work in two areas in particular where there's a tremendous paucity of primary care doctors and the primary care wait list in Franklin County, New York, and in the Malone service area way up in Northern New York is almost two years and there are almost no options for primary care. So I find myself basically as an ER doctor putting metformin and losartan in the water. And one of the biggest impacts I can have is by basically doing bedside echo and doing you know, abdominal ultrasound both to look for aortic disease, but also to look for mass lesions, to look for lung lesions, to really at the bedside, try and engage with the patient and get some of this primary care work started, um, even out of an ER context, because on so many occasions, I am the only point of access for many of my patients to meet with care. But again, I think, especially in some of the more rural environments where there just isn't another imaging modality, if I'm relegated to physical exam in remote Alaska and I have two lab tests, one's a urine pregnancy and one's a urinalysis, what else do I have? You know, I have this incredibly powerful tool or I have a stethoscope um, and that doesn't really help me, you know, with but really much of anything to be quite truthful. Um, but I think again, it's just every patient gets this and the experience I had in the most remote of settings just blossomed into these other settings that seem like they're tertiary or at least it's a hospital, but with no primary care access, they end up being just about the same. And it's really um, that powerful immediate visualization by the patient tool in addition to visualization by you as a diagnostic measure. So one thing that I like about using the ultrasound to show the patient what's going on, and I'm just going to be really basic. So something that I see every day in primary care is sinusitis. And to show the patient that I can put an ultrasound on their maxillary sinuses and say, look, if you, here's the bone. And if you see anything past it, it's positive. And when they see nothing, and then I can tell them, oh, that means you don't have a bacterial sinusitis in there, that is so powerful because then I can counsel the patient. So I know you have a viral URI <laughs> and here's why, and this is why it's going to get better. But Hey, you know, if it changes, we can always rescan it. And it's a, it's a beautiful teaching tool because it's a very obvious positive, negative thing. And a patient can look at that and say, Oh yeah, there's nothing past that line. I believe you. And so that has helped me reduce antibiotic prescribing for the common sinus symptom of the viral URI that's super common in primary care. Wow, what, what a great story, right? I'm sure, Mike, that's something that uh, you face with a lot. And the power, of, again, like you said, just giving that visualization, I could see how that could relate to patients to being like, okay, maybe I don't need antibiotics. And Ash, thanks for your insights. I think we got a, a, a question here from uh, one of our attendees. Uh, Craig, I think this is for you. Um, what thresholds of carotid artery occlusion do you use to inform differential clinical care? Um, so that is, you know, you don't have to dive in, but I, I imagine you make it patient specific, right, for those thresholds of IMT measurements. So I, I'm a walking book of cliches. So um, Mark Twain said, it's not what we don't know that gets us into trouble, but what we know that just isn't so. And this focus on the obstruction, occlusion is part of the coding language, but it's really about arterial wall inflammation. And so I don't know if you can put back that second slide with the graphic that um, waiting for somebody to be occluded chronically is uh, you know, really like waiting for a stage four cancer before you, you know, bother to take, you know, even look for it. And so the, the point of view, of, the point to act is when you have a little bit of disease, just like you wouldn't wait to act if you had a little bit of cancer or, you know, if someone's a little bit pregnant, you know, you, you wouldn't ignore it until it was much more, more severe. So I, I think it's almost a different language that I learned about 10 years ago that's led to the out, type of outcomes that I described. Um, so anyway, I, I, 
I hope that's yep. helpful. Yeah. Um, Greg, I think I think your point is there that you know the value of yes, you know, if you're at the stage of, of evaluating somebody for occlusion, there's definitely value there, right, for detection of uh, occlusion. But there's so much more value even in the in the earlier disease states of detection and screening and being like your your buzzword of being proactive to looking at something like the IMT measurement, right, to be able to see that and it giving you a much earlier indication of someone heading uh, a certain direction. Um, and I think that's that's where the powerful is as uh, of of ultrasound itself. I get excited about these things like you know the analogy in the echo world is left atrial size and looking at that for earlier detections of things and being able to evaluate is a is a common thing that people use as a great screener. I you know IMT measurements is another potential unlock for us to be able to evaluate and help with their screening. So exciting. I think we uh, Peter, do you see this other question here about fatty liver disease? Maybe should we hop into that? Oh, you're on mute, Peter. Most people are happy when I'm on mute, just for the record. Um, there's a question from David Glean uh, asking if any of you are using POCUS for fatty liver disease and that it's a common finding and just wondering if, if that's happening in your realm or or how do you think about that in, in the spectrum of screening? I, I haven't. I use... Uh... A body composition analyzer that uh, measures and reports visceral fat, and then also translates that to visceral. I'm sorry, percent body fat, and translates to the visceral fat as a way of indicating again trends in improvement in fatty liver and visceral fat. But uh, so I, I I haven't really seen any um, uh, tutorials on imaging liver for fatty liver disease. I'm sure they exist, but. Um, one one thing about it, if one, from the point of view, of one of the reasons I love arterial disease is is so ubiquitous and it's so central to all these other conditions. So if you're taking steps and measures to improve one's arterial intermedia inflammation, you're going to get them on a less inflammatory diet and see less insulin resistance and less fatty liver disease and all things will improve. And I it occurs to me, I mean, what this I use this probe probably less for diagnostics and measurements than just to get somebody's attention. So I could use it this way or I could just hit them on the head with it, you know, as a way of getting their attention. But I, I think this is actually a little more kind and powerful. So yeah, I mean um well Ash uh, looks like do you have any thoughts there? Uh, my, so I think yeah. For me, you know, this is not a routine part of my ER practice, but I think what's exciting about this question is someone just asked it. I just looked up an American Journal of Gastroenterology review showing the impact of POCUS on fatty liver. And I'm like, why the hell couldn't I do this? Can we say yeah. hell on this? Um, <laughs> yes. We got some coaching at the beginning and F-bombs were out. supposed to work. So, <laughs> um, so, you know, I mean, for me, this is like, all right, I might go and be in a space where there's limited primary care, or I'm going to be the best ultrasonographer to support my primary care colleagues. Like, all right, somebody's written a couple papers on this. This is the kind of thing where if you are using this every day for other indications, I look at the liver all the time. I look at the common bile duct. I looked at the kidney next to the liver. I look at the gallbladder. Why couldn't I do that? It's probably going to take some reps. So every time I'm looking at a you know, patient that might have biliary colic or might have a right-sided kidney stone, I'm going to practice this scan anyway. So why not add that piece? And probably in 20 scans is probably the ultrasonography training they did for these folks. Like you could add this to your practice. So I feel like why not? And if the intervention is telling the patient about it and lifestyle modification, I, I can do that. So I think to me, like, this is the lifelong learning stimulus of POCUS as a screening tool. And if you're doing the other scans, learning and, you know, filling in the blanks for some new application um, just means more POCUS. I think fatty liver is a little tricky because there's such a nuance. And when you're learning ultrasound, when you change the game, you change how bright everything is. And you, oh, that liver looks a little bit more hyperechoic than this other liver. But then on the other hand, I've got this obese individual and their liver looks a little darker and that's because we're having this attenuation impact. So I find it a little bit challenging in, in my personal practice to be confident about my diagnosis of fatty liver disease in, in primary care, but I will flip it a little bit and I'll say, if I want to coach someone and I already know that they are 
in that domain. And I put the ultrasound on them and I said, well, look at this uh, abdominal adiposity. I, I can see the, the, the fat cells around your organs. And that actually is somewhat pretty easy to see, especially like around the kidney, that liver kidney interface. You can see the, the, the differences between different people. And so that you can actually measure it. So it's a little bit more objective for me. And so that can be a helpful coaching tool that is a little bit more straightforward or black and white compared to the, the nuances of fatty liver, in my personal opinion. No, great topic. I, just to chime in on the R&D side, I think, as you type, there is a growing body of evidence to show the value of, of ultrasound as and point of care ultrasound devices actually in this. And I think, but it's it's still an emerging area. Um, hopefully AI will help in terms of Mike, what you brought up about the idea of standardization for being able to uh, be able to evaluate that using a, a uniform application of ultrasound emittance. Um, the one thing I would say that it's it's another way exciting to think about the fact of the potential of what can happen now, right? Because image quality for handheld devices have gotten to the stage where people are really now asking that question of, hey, can I actually look at fatty liver before where handheld devices before were like, here's your liver, right? Now we've gotten to that detail where people are actually considering and evaluating it. And it's an exciting time because I definitely think it's it, we're just getting that onto that cusp of how we can really evaluate the improvement of image quality um, from these handheld devices. Uh, we have a, a question on DVT. Um, yeah. Luis, uh, yeah. how about the use of diagnosis of DVT? Can it save time and money, especially if you have DOAC uh, med samples? And, and, you know, ironically, we were yeah. teaching DVT today at UVM. And, and this also, I think as we've been talking about screening and patients coming in and, and having some value in the imaging for their uh, health care in longitudinal terms, you know, this is a very common referral, right? So it's very often, and Ash, this is something you experience in ED often, where there's someone who has the signs and symptoms of a DVT and it's a relatively straightforward scan. And so it's just the concept of how ultrasound in a clinic enhances patient care from reducing downstream testing, testing or transfer to a facility if you have it available to get testing as you, you know, if you describe someplace where there's nothing else besides ultrasound. Would anyone like to comment about their DVT world? I used it to rule it out on, my, on myself one time. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, what doctor wants to go to the emergency room for a for a test? Um, so, but perfect. Definitely, it's a common common question that comes up in in my practice. I, I've gotten uh, a, a handful of referrals from my colleagues here. I've diagnosed a DVT in middle of nowhere, Arizona. That's over an hour away from anything, and yeah, I do have Eliquis samples. I think those are the only ones I have right now, but to have the direct oral anticoagulant samples in your office is such a beautiful thing because you can make the diagnosis and start the treatment all at the same time. And uh, I teach people when they're learning DVT, the biggest mistake is just don't, you don't push hard enough um, to rule it out. Uh, and as long as you know that you're pushing hard enough that, that our artery is gonna even start pulsing at you, you're pushing hard enough then. Um, but for me, it's a, it's a pretty easy scan to learn. Uh, you can get reps pretty easily. Uh, and uh, once you know that, you can have some pretty good confidence that you can make a measurable difference in people's lives, uh, potentially saving many lives because it's a pretty common thing to have to rule in or rule out. So yeah, it's a very common thing in my clinic to hear. You know, I'm not no bit. Oh, oh yeah, yeah. Ash, please go ahead. Yeah, just echo the same. I mean, the, the throughput saved time in smaller hospitals who often have no ultrasound after hours. You know, that uh, several of the residents asked if I then send the patient for some comprehensive study at some point. My answer now has become uniformly no because most of my patients wouldn't follow up for that anyway. And I think the more reps you get, the more confident as you follow vessels down into the calf that is really not a hard exam. And it's really satisfying for the patient. All this time you would have spent on the phone coordinating an outpatient ultrasound you just spent at the bedside with the patient caring about them. So your sort of I care about you score exponentially raises as your ultrasound skill improves as your throughput time is so much better. So I find this to be 
invaluable for any kind of really ER primary care, even any location, even a tertiary care center, it's pretty common that um, this involves a trip to a different building, a different site, a different wait time, a different bill. Um, and if it can be done there, it's a massive time saver. Yeah, and I, I think for those of you who are in the audience who uh, of, are interested in doing DBT studies, one of the things that's really fascinating about DBT, I think, uh, to Mike's comment, it's not a very difficult study. I mean, you're, what's nice, the anatomical anatomy is very simple in that you have a vein and artery next to each other. And as long as you've got to identify the greater saphenous vein coming in to what's going to be the iliac um, and go down from there and do greater compression, the data is really clear that for patients who are low to moderate probability of having DVT, it's, it's, it's something that excluding or including is very effective in lots of different environments. And and the reality for many of us who do DVT often, most of the studies are negative. And again, it's a way to have someone who's presenting with nervousness about leg pain, concerned about having a clot. Craig, you scanned yourself, right? You, you, just just the, the cadence of being able to compress vessels all the way down to the popliteal fossa and, and offload that fear or that disease is really of a benefit. And I, I'll say that we also are concerned about DVTs emotionally from the concept of missing one that's going to cause a fatal saddle embolism. We're talking about different diseases a bit. And so the likelihood of missing a clot that's going to become a saddle embolism is fleeting in term, just by walking down. I'll say one thing really quickly for those of you who are listening. There is always the uh, the mnemonic about uh, pop on top when you go into the pop to fossa. I'm going to do my mnemonic is don't crop your pop Probably the most effective thing you can do when you're scanning for DVT is remember to angle your probe proximally towards the adductor canal where the vessel rotates from popliteal to femoral. That's the membrane. That's where clots form. And that's where, if you look at the literature, that's where the misses are. So DVT is awesome. Simple study. Don't crop your pop. All right, let's move on. Well, well on that, like, let's move on to... What are the, the biggest use cases? Greg, I already know what you're going to answer for uh, uh, for this one, but uh, uh, Mike can ask, like, where do you see in that care, in that clinic-based environment, where are the most common point-of-care ultrasound exams you're doing? Um, and if you could tell a little bit about, one, what those are, what the process was for you to learn, and how that potentially has impact efficiency. A lot, big question, but. Yeah, I'll try to capture that all for you here. <laughs> Sounds great. So, yeah, so there's the mixture of sort of the urgent care type of stuff and sort of the screening stuff. Uh, I uh, Bladder is a very common thing that we'll scan. Postploid residual, very easy to learn, easy to practice. Uh, love the AI tools now uh, developed uh, around that. So the, the bladder volume is, is very easy to learn. You could probably learn that on a simple YouTube video and having the probe done. Uh, so, so post void residuals, uh, carrying for prostates, um, looking at, uh, gall, gallbladder is a very common thing that I'll scan. Uh, a lot of people are very worried that they have a gallstone. It's, it's pretty nice when you see it because it's, Hey, look at this bright white thing on the screen. And so that's good. I, I learned that first by doing, uh, your ultrasound month in medical school, but then I reinforced it with a weekend course, uh, where we did a lot of urgent care and emergency care type ultrasounds. So a weekend course of practice was a pretty good way to learn that for the first time. And then I just had to keep finding gallbladders after that. The common bile duct is a lot harder, a lot more nuanced there. It took me a while to add that on as part of that, but the gallbladder itself, I think that's pretty easy. Uh, you just need a little bit of time to learn that. But lung is a very common one for me. Uh, so a lot of people come in for, I'm short of breath, difficulty breathing. I'm short of breath and now I have peripheral edema. And so you pop the ultrasound on and it takes seconds mm -hmm. to, to rule in or rule out pleural effusions, pulmonary edema, uh, pneumonia, very common, very similar type of things you're looking for. I think it's really easy to learn. Again, you probably only need a couple hours if or less to learn that. I teach that in a one hour section of the course that I teach on that. I learned it in a similar length of time. And that's one my colleague, uh, who's done a lot less ultrasound in her career, she'll regularly pop the ultrasound on, roll out pleural fusions, pulmonary edema, and pneumonia. Uh, even my patients love looking at it. They're like, oh, I saw a beeline. 
Um, and we do have AI and beeline counters and stuff to make it easier. Um, but it's kind of fun. We'll be looking at the patients who are like, yeah, there's a beeline. There's a beeline. I was like, yeah, but it's only one. It's okay. <laughs> three. Uh, so lung is very common, gallbladder. Um, I have patients with liver disease that I'll just routinely check their ascites level. And so that's pretty easy. Uh, bladder is very common. Uh, and then, yeah, pregnancy, um, checking uh, fetal movement, fetal heart rate, those things are really, really easy. So anyone who's pregnant, that's really nice to do. Ruling out an early first trimester, yeah, it's not the same as, as doing a transvaginal ultrasound if you just have an abdominal probe. Um, but in the thin patient, you can get some pretty early intrauterine pregnancies. I think I had one that was just under six weeks the other day. And it was nice because I was able to say, yeah, here it is, look at this. And then what's even better with, with my butterfly device, I have that cloud storage and you can send that de-identified link. And so you can share with the pregnant paper patients um, their images electronically, and then they can share that with their friends and family. And that's a huge win. And so a lot of times they'll just come and see me routinely anyways, just to follow up um, so they, they can see how things are progressing. Uh, so those are sinus is common, skin is common, ruling out abscess is a common one I'll do. So that, mm. that's really easy. Again, you could probably YouTube that, that one. What does an abscess look like compared to like a cellulitis uh, or like skin nodules, a common referral amongst my colleagues? Because people are like, oh, I got this bump. What is it? Is it a lipoma? Is it a cyst? Um, yes, sometimes they still get surprised by what it is. Um, but in general, try to figure out, okay, what layer of skin is it? Is this something that I can address with my skills? Um, and then using it to, to plan stuff from there. I think that's pretty easy and low hanging fruit. And you could probably YouTube that one pretty quickly without doing a formal course. You know, that's, the, that's the, gosh, that's like, a, that's a full clinic day. <laughs> really there's a, a, you know, there's a question from Katerina on the best course a resident can take to be certified in POCUS. And Ash, again, I was thinking about your how you talk about what you advise to those family medicine residents that you work with about frequency of scanning. And and, and I'd wonder if you'd want to compliment bo com comment on both the question and also what your solution has been with your residents, which has been pretty fascinating. So I find that the courses are great and they give you some foundation and you finish them with a lot of pizzazz about POCUS, but what you really need, I mean, it's like learning any skill. You went to a mountain bike clinic, you learned how to knit, you, you know, any kind of, you all of a sudden know how to make the most beautiful meringues and you lose it if you're not doing this every day. So for me, some of the things to take from the course are how do you position your body next to the patient? I always tell our residents, it's like you're skiing next to the patient or you're in this athletic position. It's your ultrasound yoga, your right hands with the probe on the patient, your left hands doing the knobology, you're in a triangle. That's like your power position. You'd never see an ultrasound tech craning over next to the bed. So every patient you go in, you have your point of care ultrasound, you're gonna scan the patient. If you're learning, I think picking you know, one particular scan to focus on at a time, but every patient that gets a chest X-ray, do a lung ultrasound beforehand and triangulate and follow up. Watch videos on either butterfly or coreultrasound.com. There are tons of readily available high yield resources. And honestly, for me, the better thing to do than any particular course or this course is better than that is taking that course and then making sure that 25% of your patients in your clinic are getting some kind of scan, that you put the probe on the patient you know, a quarter of the time you're in the room with them, practice having the right position, practice having all your stuff so you're not fumbling around covering them in gel, practice saving the images so that then after your clinic, you can review those images you captured with someone that's a department POCUS champion or a mentor that you find through various other means. But if you don't consistently do that, you're not going to develop kind of the muscle memory so that when you really have a thinker, you're like, oh, I have to actually use this ultrasound for a really important diagnostic question. Then you're ready to use your brain and switch to type two thinking, but you got to get the reps in to get the basic body position. So you're ultrasounding and can really focus on the image. And that just takes, again, time in the room, simple things like body position, having all your supplies, and then knowing the maneuvers to get every view you need to have a truly diagnostic quality scan. 
some powerful insights there. Um, Craig, I wanted to give you an opportunity, just real quick, wanted to ask like your process for educating and training and um, for karate as well as for any other areas that you're using um, in, in your care practice environment. Well, I, I'm, I sort of feel like I need to apologize for being a one trick pony, but on the other hand, uh, if you get really good at it, you can get make a living at it. Um, my, you know, my interest has been primarily training people who come in contact with people, with patients who need to know, you know, there's where they stand with regard to arterial disease. And you cannot judge a book by its cover. I, I have had so many bit looking athletes, you know, that I have scanned, hey, hey, let's just take a look. And, you know, they have horrible looking arteries and bad people that you would imagine are a heart attack waiting to happen. And they have pristine arteries. So it, you just, uh, of course, there are trends and there are their norms, but those are exceptions that prove the rule. Um, as far as the, what, one of the beauties about, first of all, I mean, you can walk all, around all day, you know, practicing on yourself and very few people will turn you down if you want to do a, you know, ultrasound somebody's neck. Now, you know, abdomen, you know, chest, you know, it gets a little bit dicey, you know, it's a privacy issue. So, you know, and so you can get in a lot of reps on family, on, you know, on colleagues, on staff, on, you know, and then yourself. So, you know, get really, and it, and really to me that, that, you know, a lot of, I'm glad somebody brought up ergonomics. I mean, how many people, you know, grab the probe so tightly or, you know, and it's all about just, you know, and one of the nice things with dealing with dentists is that they're already accustomed to using a handpiece, you know, the drill, and it just fits perfectly into their, their skill set. Um, so I, 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 and the other side to this is I've trained, uh, most of the people that I've trained, I've trained on online. Uh, and I've tried using the tele teleguidance. I think it has applicability as a, maybe not quite ready for prime time exactly because of the, the requirements. And it's only on Apple, I think, if, if I'm not mistaken. But, but if I can get somebody, a, a student to sign in on a desktop on their Zoom, on their, figure out how to sign in on their phone on Zoom, and I do the same, we can have an interaction back and forth, you know, either scanning themselves or, uh, you know, a friend or colleague or, you know, a willing subject. So I, I think to me that is, and I know this, the one, you know, going very deep on one, one procedure that has a lot of leverage to do so much change, you know, outcomes so much is what has gotten me excited about it. Yes, I have, you know, used it for checking bladder volumes. Guess who I've done it on as being a 60 year, 68 year old man. Uh, so, and, and it's, it's very easy to learn, you know, uh, lumps, you know, is it, is it a solid mass? Is it a cyst, you know, a, a man, you know, with a lump in his breast, you know, oh yeah, it's just a cyst. You don't need to worry about that. Um, so, so I think uh, the ease of use and learning and training, and I believe remote training for much of this is, is really uh, one of the most exciting things is, let's face it, who has time to travel? You know, costs uh, are, are an issue. Uh, getting people to d dedicate the time. Uh, I think it, it just, there's so many, uh, you know, what, what, what's the, I challenge anybody to come up with the, you know, the downside to it. So one of the, a really quick question for you all, and then we're, we're getting towards the end. There's a question we want to answer from Kent as well. As you mentioned the concept of um, taking the time to scan, and it does feel like some of the reticence to learn is that focus takes too much time and detracts from time in the clinic and adds to someone's burden of time. I wonder if, if you or any of the other panelists want to comment just briefly, what do you say to somebody or how do you uh, offload that that pressure for time to have someone become successful at using ultrasound? I'll, I'll take a bit of a shot. I mean, oh. it's, it's fun. I mean, we make time for the things that we you know find to be fun. Um, and it, it to me, it replaces a lot of clinical question and answer, you know, time. That's, you know, so I'll say that for the end, but you know, if you, you can do things more efficiently and patient satisfaction and engagement is better, I think that's something that we all should be happy and, and proud about. I, I, I'm not, I'd be interested to learn how the, you know, the financial, yes, I mean, everything has a financial implication to it. So in the primary care setting, and maybe that's another topic for another day of, 
you know, billing and being reimbursed for that effort. But I largely use it to replace E&M time and, uh, you know, document, I have better documentation of the finding than I ever would learn, you know, from asking 20 questions. Yeah, I find the same that, you know, if you are going into a patient's room and then you think during that encounter, oh, an ultrasound would be useful, you're right. It's really hard to make time for that in a busy day when you're coming out and going back into that room. It's all about bringing it in to every patient. And when something comes up, this lump or bump, this pain that's right here, my kid has a cold. Do they have pneumonia? I think like your sinus example, Mike, is one of my favorites where I just have the parent hug the kid and do racing stripes of gel on the back and racing stripes of gel, flip them around to the front and say like, hey, this is a virus. There's no big consolidation. You can see their beautiful lungs, their beautiful ribs, like go home happy um, and just make it through viral misery. And I think for all of these, really having that ultrasound in the room with you every time and just assuming it's going to be part of your patient care. But all of a sudden I've made the diagnosis. I feel really confident in it. I'm not writing a note where I considered six things, but just kind of blew them off because I didn't really test other than my stethoscope in a two-year-old. Um, so you're, I think, again, you're like completing the diagnosis and the treatment. Um, we have a different billing strategy in emergency or a different way we bill in emergency medicine and structure, but we have just found it opens up immense other resources, reduces our transfers, reduces time spent on the phone, like all that time you spend on the phone arranging an ultrasound somewhere else or thinking whether this is heart failure or not, not being able to look at the heart you could have been spending finding the answer. So I think just that commitment to in the room every time probe on the patient. That's awesome. Um, wow, we're at, we're, we're at a, yeah. we're gonna, we're gonna, well, Go ahead, we're Peter. Yeah, time. Yeah. I was saying we're out of yeah. time, we have five minutes left. So I would love for each of you in the, in the last five minutes, if you have, and if you have a, per, look, we have people who've been listening to a really great conversation. Just curious who, you know, if you could give advice to all the attendees from your point of view on point of care, is there a pearl of wisdom you'd like to sign off with? And thank you again, all of you for attending. Thank you, Craig and Mike and Ash for just, this has been wonderful. Who wants to go first? Craig, you had one that you were ready. So let's go ahead. I'll, quickly, the, the people asked about liability, and you're, you're already exceeding the standard of care by offering point of care ultrasound. So I, I, I would answer that question. You know, you, you that's what medical malpractice is all about. But my pearl is scan first and ask questions later. Mike? Yeah, start simple and repeat, repeat, repeat. So a sinus ultrasound is one ultrasound, do it again and again and again. And as you get confident with one, then add another scan. And uh, you can do that. And um, for what it's worth that people are wondering, I don't actually charge for my ultrasounds. I do direct primary care, it's beautiful. I don't bill for most things I do um, because I can do it just as quick as I can listen with my stethoscope. And as you get good at your scans, you're not wasting time. You're getting answers and moving on. That's awesome. I think for me, it's make the little bit of extra time it takes to think about the scan you did, get clips so you can review the images yourself and spend the five minutes really debriefing and watching a video of someone doing it beautifully and think about how you can do it better again. Like that five minutes that you spend reviewing somebody else's video or reviewing it with someone that's more skilled than yourself are just utter gold to get a better image the next time. Those Great are awesome insights. pearls. Devinder, a pleasure as well. You want to take take it to the end? Thank you as well, everybody. Thank you for listening. And a shameless plug, we are also doing offering uh, office hours every month now where we're just signing on for an hour and there to try and talk about different ultrasound applications, answer questions you have about scanning, and just do that on a regular basis for anyone who would like to join us. Devinder. No, I thank you again to all the panelists. I think the discussion was great. You know, Peter, we need to maybe do another one of these just because there was so much engagement. Really appreciate all the attendees. The questions were great. Really appreciate everyone's insights. Um, for those the, the questions that weren't, feel free to reach back out to Butterfly. I did sit her out. Uh, we we're happy to follow up, perhaps on the billing area. I know we're planning on doing a 
uh, webinar upcoming around infrastructure and cloud support. Maybe we can address that uh, area around billing because hard to finish that in 30 seconds. Um, but the last thing I would say, you know, what Pearl is, you know, the, what everyone says is you, you got to do it, right? And you got to support the idea of both synchronous and asynchronous learning to the question about what what workshop is better. You know, now that, that I think that the, the age of that has come and gone, right? There's so many great areas. Find a one that you can do with your friends. Lots of online solutions. Butterfly offers a great solution, but there's there's lots of great online tools, but you need to support both asynchronous and synchronous learning strategies to really get past that hump. And I think the panelists here are a testament to when you pass that hump, look at the power of what you can do for your patients, right? And so I thought this was so incredibly insightful. Um, you know, really appreciate how you guys are pushing medicine forward. And um, yeah, with that, uh, should we close out, Peter? Close out. Thank you all. All right. Keep Thank scanning. you, everybody. Scan often. Keep scanning. Scan often. Keep scanning and love it. It's just so much fun. And it's great patient care. Thank you. Take care, yeah. everybody. Take care. Good night, everyone.